All right, looks like we're rolling then. Okie dokie. Welcome everyone to week seven of Pierce Platypus. Um, so we've got a whole bunch of topics here. Today's a little bit lighter than some of the previous weeks, but we've still got a, um, some useful stuff for you. Um, and yeah, we're going to start off with muscle. So this is one of the four primary tissue types. Um, we've already gone through epithelium connective uh, and connective tissue, I think, possibly. Um, but this is going to be one of the most dynamic of them, obviously, because it, um, well, moves you. Um, and in order to talk about it, we need to establish a bit of a vocabulary. We need to be able to talk about um, certain sort of common parts of muscle cells, um, which are used in um, all the different types. So the first thing I want you to understand is that when we talk about a muscle fiber, we just mean a single muscle cell. Um, and so this is most useful in skeletal muscle. We'll get into the differences in a moment. Um, but basically, skeletal muscle is very fibrous. It's very long, thin bundles of cables sort of appearing. Um, and so then you can really see in those cases why we call it a muscle fiber. It's a big, long cell. Um, and we can also call it a myocyte. So you might see somewhere in your, te in your textbooks, in your lectures, whatever, they sort of use them interchangeably because they've both been um, a single muscle cell. A myofibril um, is a bundle of parallel filaments. So basically, um, we inside the muscle cell, we have a whole bunch of actin, myosin, filaments, that sort of thing. Um, and so when we take a whole bundle of them together, um, which aren't separated by any internal membrane, we call that a myofibril. Now, the sarcolemma is a way of talking about this sort of big membrane on the outside. Um, so this is one cell, remember? Um, this is basically the plasma membrane. Um, but an interesting thing about this is that it's capable of conducting an action potential. Um, and it's going to be very important when we actually talk about how muscles contract. Um, and it forms a neuromuscular junction with neurons. So your motor neurons will synapse right onto the end of this sarcolemma. We also have the sarcoplasm reticulum. So you would remember way back when we talked about uh, the different organelles, we mentioned that um, the smooth ER actually gets specialized in um, skeletal muscle cells in particular. Um, in order to help um, store calcium. Um, you're about to see exactly why calcium storage is important, but this is it, the, sarcoplas the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, you can see it over in the diagram to the right. There's quite a good job of conveying the sort of general shape. And then we have transverse tubules. Um, so these are basically, they're continuous with the outer plasma membrane. So they're like an infolding, which goes all the way through the muscle cell. Um, so the purpose of these is to allow us to conduct um, that action potential inside the cell. Um, so if you can see here, our teacher will sort of nestled right up against the um, psychoplasmic reticulum at various places. And the, the net outcome of that is that when I have an action potential coming down into the cell, um, it can very quickly spread all throughout the inside of the cell. Um, and so I can get a nice big um, sort of simultaneous contraction from all the parts of the muscle cell, which is what we want. We want to have a nice big unified contraction to deal with. All right, so when we take one myofibril, one of those big bundles of fibers, um, we can cut them lengthwise into sarcomeres. Um, and the definition of those is the smallest repetitive contract, contractile unit of a muscle cell. Um, so if you look at our little um, diagram on the right here, you can see that we have one sarcomere between the two Z discs um, on either side. And we're going to explain all of these bands and discs because they're quite useful when we talk about histological examination. Um, and you are very likely to get a question on these somewhere um, at some point. So the A band, if we look here, we can see that the, um, the myofibril is basically composed of a bunch of big thick myosin filaments and they're held within um, a bunch of actin filaments. So they're all parallel to one another, um, but they're not quite in line. The actin is sort of around the myosin. So we call the A band anywhere where the myosin is. So in some places, there's going to be overlap between myosin and actin, you can see here. Um, and so those areas look very dark. So you can compare um, the diagram at the top to the actual micrograph on the bottom, um, which shows us how this actually appears. Then we have um, the bit right in the middle, um, which is only myosin. Um, and this is actually called the H zone. So skipping ahead a little bit. Um, in the diagram at the bottom, it's called the bear zone for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I've only ever seen it um, referred to as the H zone in Monash materials, so stick with that one. Um, but the general idea is the A band means anywhere where we have myosin. In some places, that looks denser than other places, um, but it's all myosin. The I band is only actin. Um, so it's basically the places where the A band isn't. So if you go down to sarcomere, um, you get lots and lots of repeating I bands and A bands. 
Um, the Z disk or line is the edge of the sarcomere. So you can see that's the really, really dense um, part of this, um, this micrograph. Um, and you can see is where we have that little sort of zigzag structure, which connects different bits of um, actin, which would belong to different um, sarcomeres. And then we have the M line, which is just really, it's just the middle of the sarcomere. So you can see here, um, the sarcomere starts at a Z disc, goes through um, part of an I band, so not a whole I band, then the whole A band, then part of an I band, then it ends at a Z disc. Um, and we repeat this again and again and again. That's what we mean when we say um, repetitive unit. Um, each of your myofibril will be made out of so many, you can have muscle cells which are really, really long. And the way they get that long is by having a lot of these repeated structures again and again. All right, so sliding filament theory is basically how we explain um, muscle contraction. So um, you will learn more about this in semester two. So we're gonna give you a sort of shorter look at it now. And then we might, uh, we'll, we'll tell you more about it when you guys learn more about it. Um, so what you, we need to understand first, if you look at that little yellow bit there, um, this diagram doesn't actually um, show you the impact of CO2 plus directly. Um, but if you look, if you were to look at this really close, you could see um, the sort of bands wrapped around um, the actin. So that's troponin and tropomyosin. And when we have calcium binding to those, those sort of um, pull away slightly from the actin and they reveal active sites on the actin uh, for the myosin to join to. So at the same time, as this is happening, your CO2 plus is released, um, your myosin heads are going to split an ATP molecule into ADP and PI, um, and that gives them the energy they need to reorient. Um, and we'll see how they got out of orientation in the first place in a sec. So the next step is that we bind to um, the actin. Remember, we revealed those active sites, and now we're gonna to bind to the actin. Um, and then the head is going to rotate and when it rotates, because it's, it's staying connected to that part of the, um, the actin, but it's also pushing forward slightly, it contracts the entire muscle. So it shortens the length of the sarcomere. And if we shorten the length of every sarcomere in the muscle, then we shorten the entire muscle. Um, so that's what actually happens in muscle contraction. And then when we're done with that, we release the ADP and PI from the myosin head um, and we restore, uh, sorry, and um, the CO2 plus from troponin, this one is um, uh, not necessarily going to happen. I'll explain that in a sec. Um, so we, we release the ADP and PI um, from the myosin head and then a new ATP binds. So it's sort of a repeating process again. We want to be able to do this again and again and again. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll um, bind the ATP molecule, split it, release it, and then bind a new one in preparation um, for a new one. So at the start of the power stroke, so before um, we do the whole thing, um, we have an ATP molecule there ready to provide the energy for it. Um, now, about the CO2 plus. Um, so the reason that they this diagram says um, it'll continue as long as the CO2 plus level in the cyclobasm is high um, is because in practice, we end up having sort of a continuous um, binding of CO2 plus and release of CO2 plus. Um, when we have a high enough concentration of calcium in the area. So when you're trying to contract a muscle, in practice, your, your uh, muscle cell is going to be constantly releasing um, CO2 plus from your sarcoplasmic reticulum. And once we have enough of that in the area, um, the troponin and tropomycin never get back enough to actually block the active sites, which is good because we want to have those active sites available um, so that the myosin can bind and actually contract the muscle. All right, so let's talk about the different types of muscle. So skeletal muscle um, is probably the most distinctive. Um, so it's a very cylindrical shape. You can see all of the muscle fibers are going to be parallel. Um, and there's multiple peripheral nuclei per cell. So there are many, more than one nuclei is one of those exceptional cells. And they're not and they're not located in the inside of the cell. They're located in the outside of the cell because the inside of the cell is given over to all of those muscle fibers. If you look at that little micrograph on the top right here, you can see all those dark spots for the nucleus. They're on the outside of the cell. You also notice um, a lot of like sort of perpendicular bands across these muscle cells. That's what we call striations, basically. Um, and so they're actually formed by, if I pull it back a little bit, by all of these bands. So if you can see the minute differences here, that's what makes these up. So you can see also immediately how many sarcomeres there are in a single um, muscle cell. It's a lot. Um, and skeletal muscle is quite good at regenerating. So if you were to, you know, tear a muscle or something, 
um, you'd have a quite a good chance of, of repairing it pretty much fully. So we also have a, um, we also talk about organization of the skeletal muscle because it tends to be in a pretty uniform form. Um, so you have on the lowest level, your muscle fibromyocyte, which is surrounded by an endomycin. And then you go up, you have a fascicle, so a bundle of muscle fibers, um, and that's surrounded by a paramycin. And then you'll have, of course, the muscle itself, which is surrounded by epimycin and connected by a tendon to bone. Um, so the reason, reason we call it skeletal muscle is it because it's um, connected to your skeleton, go figure. Now, we also need to talk about different types of skeletal muscle fibers. Um, so basically you have different uh, muscle fibers for different purposes. So our slow titch uh, muscle fibers, they're very small. Um, they don't fatigue very easily, um, but they don't provide as much energy. Um, and they have a lot of mitochondria, excuse me. Um, so you, where are we gonna find these things like back muscles, things like long distance runners? because they're basically very good at providing long sustained contraction without getting tired. So your back needs to like constantly contract very slightly in order to maintain your posture. Um, and long distance runners, they're gonna to need to have constant um, contraction, um, but not super high intensity contraction um, compared to the other runners we're gonna be talking about. Type two fast twitch fibers. So they um, are going to give us more um, tension, more activity, more motion, but um, they're going to tire more quickly. Um, so they, they undergo anaerobic glycolysis and they have many mitochondria um, and loss of glycogen. Loss of glycogen, why? Because they need to store energy, basically. So where would we find this? So these are sort of an intermediate one. Um, so you find them in people like 400 meter, 800 meter runners. So they're not instant, um, but they're a lot shorter term than uh, long distance runners or back muscles. We also have faster glycolytic. So this is um, basically um, what we would find in sprinters. So it's going to fatigue very rapidly, but it's going to give us very rapid contraction at the same time. Um, so we have a trade-off there. Um, and this is what gives us sort of a precise movement, so like fine motor control as well. Um, so this has less mitochondria than the other two types we've talked about, um, but it also has lots, lots of glycogen storage. All right, we also have cardiac muscles. So um, this basically has quite an interesting shape because it can be branched. So you could have on one side, it connects to one cell and the other, on the other side, it connects to um, two cells um, or more. So it's not actually in parallel bands. It's sort of all branched and interlinking in various places, um, which you can see a little bit in the micro, uh, in the micro graph there. Um, we can have one or two nucleus, um, nuclei per cell and they're found in the middle. Um, and we do have striations because the muscle fibers are still mostly parallel parallel. Um, we have a unique structure here called intercalated discs, um, which basically join the ends of each of these cells together. Um, you can't see any of this diagram at the bottom here, um, because we this is within um, one, one cell. Um, there's no boundary with another one shown. Um, but that is a unique structure to cardiac muscle. There's lots of mitochondria because they need it to move. Um, and they have a little structure called a dyad. If you can see very closely here, it's sort of like a rake shape. Um, and that just helps it um, uh, more easily transfer that, that psychopathic reticulum charge. These have limited regenerative capabilities. So by far the worst um, type of muscle at um, growing itself back. So if you have a heart injury or if you have for whatever reason, like a, like a um, myocardial infarction, heart attack, um, and your cardiac muscle dies, that is really bad um, because it's very, very hard for the body to grow it back. And surprise, surprise, we find it in the heart. Right, the last muscle type is smooth muscle. Um, so this has sort of an elongated spindle shape, which is a fancy way of saying oval. Um, we only have one nucleus and it's in the middle um, and we do not have striations. So if you look at the bottom right there, the muscle fibers are sort of wrapped around, is it, you know, how, if you like wrapped a sausage in a string or something, um, that's sort of the look of, um, of where these filaments are gonna be. So in contrast to uh, our skeleton and cardiac muscle where we had these big orderly bundles, um, these are not at all the same thing. Um, and so we don't have striations under a micrograph. They don't have T-tubules or sarcomeres, but they use the same basic mechanism of the, the power stroke and the um, sliding filament theory. Um, so keep that in mind. You don't need to know um, how they do it exactly. Um, they are sometimes under autonomous control. Um, so either um, charges coming from themselves or charges coming from um, neurons in the gut, for example. And these have an okay regenerative capability. So not quite as good at, as um, skeletal muscle, uh, but you can grow back smooth muscle that you've lost. Um, so some of the places that they're found, uh, not exhaustive, 
um, there are other places as well, but um, particularly we find them in the gastrointestinal tract and in the lining of blood vessels. Right, so this is just a summary slide, uh, basically going through the different um, uh, different characteristics of each of the types of um, muscle cell involved. So the important things to remember here are basically the morphology, um, the connections, um, to an extent the control, and also the power. Okie dokie, do we have any questions before we go on to blood vessels? All right, looks like we're good. Um, so yeah, feel free to chuck me a question in the chat and I, I'll answer them next time I get to a pause um, or Raymond will answer them straight off the bat. Okay, Ducky. Oh, sorry, I did get another um, thing about med law. So yeah, um, you guys have your second session med law today, apparently. Um, we did med law a couple of weeks ago. That session um, should have covered everything. So like whatever you do today, if you go back and have a look at the recording for that session and the um, slide for that session, um, we should have basically covered everything. Um, shoot us a message or something like, let us know if we haven't, if there's anything that like we're still up in the air um, and we can include it next week or in the coming week. All right, let's talk about blood vessels then. So these are some of the functions of blood vessels basically. So we have oxygen exchange, um, obviously uh, you have oxygen coming in, in the lungs, it needs to diffuse into the blood vessel and then it needs to diffuse back out um, into the cells in order for us to undergo aerobic respiration. We're a big fan of aerobic respiration. It also helps regulate temperature. So you'll notice, um, say when you're cold, right? Um, you start to get um, sort of redness around your cheeks and whatnot, but that's your body trying to, um, to basically warm up the area to make sure it doesn't get too cold. And conversely, um, when you're cold, you also get um, sort of more paleness in your fingers and in your toes, in your extremities, basically, because your body goes, well, I don't care about keeping that too warm. So I'm just gonna pull the blood back from there and it's not gonna do, um, it's not gonna lose heat uh, because it can also, because whenever we warm something up, we are also losing heat. Um, pressure regulation. So this is sort of helping regulate the pressure of your entire body. You are a big bag of water. Um, we need to keep that water under the right uh, pressure um, in order for various things to function within the body. Um, fluid regulation, yes, the same thing. Um, remember, this is not only the um, arteries, it's also the veins and the um, lymphatic system. And so taken together, they help regulate where the fluid is in your body um, and what they do. And immunity is partially um, the blood and the veins, sorry, the arteries and the veins, because you do have white blood cells, um, but it's also in major part the lymphatic system. All right, so there are three layers to every blood vessel and that can, that actually um, uh, varies a lot between the different types of blood vessels. So we have our tunica intima, sorry, tunica intima, um, which is what we call endothelium. So it's the, the type of epithelium that we find specifically on um, blood vessels. So one of the major functions here is to help us um, prevent sticking of red blood cells. So keep everything moving along. Um, of course, if you remember the immune response, you'll remember that when we do want to have inflammation or something like that, we can express factors which help us become very sticky to immune cells because we do want them to stop. And we have our tunica media. So this is muscle. What type of muscle is it gonna be? Smooth muscle. Um, and you'll notice in the diagram here, it's not all parallel um, because basically we might sometimes need to contract these blood vessels or expand these blood vessels, um, but that doesn't, uh, that, that's not always gonna be in the same direction. Um, and it doesn't need to be orderly in the same way that a skeletal muscle is. So you can have a lot more variation in how these um, cells are organized. It's usually roughly circular. So instead of being longitudinal in the same directional as the blood vessel, it's actually around the blood vessel, which allows it to get like bigger or smaller. So that's the most important um, function there. Um, yeah, and then we have the tunica adventitia. So that's the sort of outer layer. Um, and so that is going to help us it's basically going to hold everything together, um, which of course is quite important. Now, just in a quick comparison here, you can see here 
um, that the big difference between arteries and veins is going to be um, the tutica media, where all that smooth muscle is, because veins don't need um, as much uh, smooth, smooth muscle, basically. So you, when you do a dissection or if you see a specimen um, in person, you'll notice the veins are much more floppy um, than the arteries. The arteries have a lot more like spring in them because they've got that muscle um, in them. You also notice really quickly there is a valve there because veins, um, as we said, they don't push things the same way that arteries do. And so they need valves to keep everything flowing the right way. Um, so that's a big difference between them and arteries. Right, so arteries, they're your big tube going away from the heart into the capillary bed. So your blood goes out of the heart, into your arteries, into the capillary bed, into your veins, and then back. Um, so we have more elastin than veins in these. Um, so they're basically, they're a little bit more structurally integral as we talked about before. Um, and again, we have thicker walls relative to lumen size. So that is not usually coming from the, intim the tunica intima or adventitia. It's usually coming from the tun tunica media. We just have more smooth muscle there. No valves because we don't need it um, because we have the heart to push. And to a degree, we also have um, elastic rebound, which you guys will talk about later on. So not every artery has oxygenated blood, okay? So this is an important thing for you guys to get. Um, the definition of artery is not a vessel which carries oxygenated blood. It's a vessel which carries oxygen, or, sorry, which carries blood away from the heart. Um, so the pulmonary arteries, um, I don't know if you guys have done cardiac circulation yet, um, but the pulmonary arteries are basically blood comes into the heart, it's deoxygenated, and then we need to send it to the lungs to be oxygenated. So we need to leave the heart in the pulmonary arteries which is blood going away from the heart, but is, which is not oxygenated. So that is an artery with deoxygenated blood. Um, and in the opposite, um, like on the flip side, that means that when we have blood coming back from the lungs, it's been oxygenated, but it's coming back to the heart. Um, so we call those pulmonary veins. So those pulmonary veins um, will be carrying oxygenated blood. And the umbilical arteries are also an exception because we have um, a different situation. Yeah, basically, that's all developmental stuff. So things can be quite different. All right. So we have different types. So we have um, your really big arteries, which are going to be your elastic arteries. Um, and so you can see there we have more elastic tissue there. There's sort of the blue um, fibers there, you can see. Um, and those sort of help us um, maintain the pressure. Because remember, the heart is pumping. Um, and the, the heart doesn't provide constant pressure, does it? it provides very peaking pressure, like it gives a spike in pressure, spike in pressure, spike in pressure, spike in pressure. Um, that's the purpose of the heart. Um, and so we need to be able to maintain and sort of even out to a degree um, that pressure stress. So muscular arteries, those are going to be more um, muscle than um, those um, than elastic tissue. Um, and those are going to branch a lot more. So these are going to help us sort of spread out the blood um, as we get closer to its final destination. All right, our veins. So this is the opposite. We have blood coming towards the heart away from the capillary bed where it came from. Um, and so we have larger tributaries um, from as we get from superficial to deep. So you'll, you'll talk about superficial veins, the ones which you'll see, like even varicose veins or whatever. Um, then that's you're seeing the really superficial veins and then they go into really big ones um, throughout your body. They have thinner walls because of that smaller tunica media. Um, and they have valves because they don't push things um, in the same way that arteries do. They don't have a big, huge muscle in your chest pushing everything out. Um, and so they need valves to make sure that things keep going back. Um, we have a special one called the portal vein, um, which takes blood between the liver and the gastrointestinal tract. You'll learn more about that when you do the said tract. Excuse me. Um, and again, we have deoxygenated blood except the pulmonary veins and the umbilical vein um, because those. Remember, we had that circuit is different um, in those areas. All right, so capillaries. So these are basically um, the interchange between the two. So when your arteries get down to, say, your finger or whatever, they need to actually diffuse the blood to your cells. Um, we have very thin walls. We have very small vessels, um, which allow us to actually have that exchange. So there's no point where we um, just straight up change from arteries to vein. Rather, we have an arteriole, which is a very small artery, and then we go to a capillary, which is just sort of this blood vessel, neither an artery nor a vein, which sits in among your cells and helps us transfer blood and oxygen and various substances between them. And then we go into a venule, 
Um, so it's sort of a continuum, if anything. It's not very easy to dif differentiate between the two, but we can say the capillaries lie between them. Um, and most of your vascular diseases occur here. So not in the big blood vessels, but in the very small ones at the very ends. Right. Now, lymphatics are also an important system. So you might have heard, you might remember about them from um, the immune system we talked about. Um, so there's a lot of white blood cells in them. Um, there's a lot of different other substances in there. So this is sort of the main role of these um, is to take away all of the fluid we have around the cell. So if we go back to um, the capillaries really quick, um, a lot of fluid is going to be flowing out of these capillaries and into the sort of interstitial fluid around the cells. Um, we want to be able to return that because we don't want to just sit there and stagnate for ages. Um, and so lymphatics um, help us facilitate that basically. Um, so drainage of extracellular tissue fluid and also filtering. Um, so both to keep it clean and also to, um, in the case of lymphocytes, which we talked about in, in um, immune system, um, to make sure that we catch antigens. Um, so the, the really important role of lymph nodes, for example, is to give us a place for our B and T lymphocytes to hang out. Um, and because this is sort of the garbage disposal of the, um, the, the cell, um, it is a really good way to find out if something's hanging out. So like you could almost think of this as, you know, how they're testing sewers for COVID. Um, this is basically that. Like we're taking all the waste and we're looking to see if anyone is giving off antigen. All right, so the lymph nodes, as I said, um, this is where all your B and T cells hang out. Um, you don't need to know, you don't need to like know this structure on the left, um, but it is useful in understanding how this whole thing works. Um, and so we have phagocytes hanging out in there, uh, which take away cell debris and foreign particles so keep the lymph um, fluid fairly free. Um, and we also have lymphocytes to recognize those antigens and mount an immune response if necessary. So if you look here, you can see two things um, which I failed to mention earlier. So first of all, um, you can see that there are many valves in the um, lymphatic system. Um, so your again, the lymph system doesn't have a big organ, i.e. the heart, to push everything along, so we need to rely on valves. Um, the lymphatic system in particular, the veins kind of have a little bit of pressure from the heart still pushing um, still sort of pushing on them through the capillaries. It's not much, but there's some. Um, this is basically no pressure. Um, and so it is driven primarily by you moving. So when you move, you know, things get moving, things get moved around. Um, and so if things can only move in one direction because of the valves, then over time they move in the right direction. Um, and so this is one of the reasons, there are other reasons, but there are many reasons, sorry, this is one of the reasons um, that when we have patients lying in bed for a long time, um, it gets really bad because your body is meant to be moving. Um, is not meant to be sitting in one place for a long time. And if we don't move things around, um, then we get problems. So the final destination of the lymphatic system is back to the venous system, because all that fluid still needs to go back into the blood, into the circulation. Um, so we dump it into the um, venous system, um, and then it goes back into the, um, the heart, basically. All right, do we have any questions about um, blood vessels for you guys? Are all three layers of vessels made up of smooth muscle? No. So the um, the uh, the um, sorry, tunica intima. So that's made up primarily of endothelium. So if I sorry if I draw pull us back up, you can see um, we've got endothelium right in the middle, and then we've got a subendothelium layer there and an internal elastic membrane. Um, so none of that is muscle. Um, so endothelium is the major component there that you need to be worried about. Um, and that is epithelial cells and not muscle cells. Your tunica media is primarily composed of um, muscle cells. Um, that's the main component. We might also have some fibers, elastic stuff, as we talked about. Um, and then the external elastic membrane there, we've got the tunica externa as well, which provides um, an external sort of protection there and um, structural integrity to it. Um, and that's basically going to um, be connective tissue. So uh, we have basically epithelium, muscle and then connective tissue. So they're definitely not all made up of smooth muscle there, but good question. Any other questions we have? Alrighty, well, if you have good, I'm gonna hand it over to Raymond. Wait, too easy. Uh, let me pull this up. So uh, our topic for today is cancer. Um, so first of all, what is it? And 
Basically, cancer is the abnormal and uncontrolled division of cells which invade and destroy surrounding tissues. Any cells can become cancerous, and it's the result of an accumulation of genetic errors. Um, aptly named, the conversion of a normal cell into a cancer cell is known as transformation. Solid masses of cancer cells are termed as tumors. Um, specific features of cancerous cells, first of all, it's resistance to inhibitory growth signals, because if they were, uh, if they weren't, they would die and you wouldn't have a cancer cell. Um, two, uh, it's because of this um, buildup of genetic uh, errors, we get, usually we see a abnormal or different karyotypes, so we sometimes see enlarged um, karyotypes when we're actually able to uh, karyotype a cancerous cell. Um, there is active tele telomerase. Um, as we know, telomerase is really important and being stressed also decreases the length of your telomerase. And as Craig Hassett often says, you don't want to be stressed or you're going to live an, uh, you know, you're going to live a shorter lifespan. And it's because that um, these telomerase, they're at the ends of your chromosomes and they basically indicate when the cells must die. And however, in terms of cancerous cells, they have this active telomerase, which actually extends the length of these, allowing them to basically be immortal and continuously um, reproduce, therefore being cancerous. Uh, two, and uh, the next one is being able to escape the immune surveillance, as usually if there is a problem with the cell, it often shows um, antigens on its surface that um, communicate with um, natural killer cells or CD8 cells that cause it to be uh, lysed and destroyed. However, basically it has an ability to prevent these antigens being expressed, therefore allowing it to survive. Um, also, um, they also show enlarged nucleus and as a tumor, grow, uh, well, as cells become more and more cancerous, we get more and more um, generic errors and this, causes the nucleus to basically expand in size as there is just more things in it. Um, we also find that they're immature. So like um, kids, a good analogy is kids that don't grow up, they don't find themselves a job. So they're basically just useless and they take up a lot of space and they basically um, end up uh, ruining everybody else's lives. <laughs> um, um, also, they have a non-contact inhibition. Basically, it's basically unlike other cells, they usually when they come in contact with another cell, they stop growing. However, for cancer cells, this is how they are able to invade into other areas. They have um, growth factors and um, they release chemicals that allow them to grow into other cells. Um, they are non-anchorage dependent. Uh, basically, they don't need to adhere to a surface for them to survive, and this also allows them to metastasize, which is moving around the body. Um, and they don't require external growth factors, as usually many cells only proliferate due to an external factor causing them initiating the cycle of um, um, mitosis. However, uh, in this case, they can do it themselves, and they basically just reproduce. Um, and changes in uh, cytoskeletons, allowing them to move. Um, the development of cancer, uh, first they can either be inherited or somatic. Inherited cancers are uh, due to, um, uh, usually happen in the gametes and approximately 10% of all cancers are inherited. And somatic cancers are basically the ones that are due to after a lifetime of uh, accumulations of genetic um, inconsistencies and errors that are not corrected. Um, this usually requires four to six mutations in a cell, and these mut mutations occur in three types of genes, the oncogenes, the tumor suppressor genes, and the mismatch repair genes. In terms of oncogenes, uh, they're also known as proto-oncogenes, which are basically the gas pedals of um, cell uh, proliferation. And basically they give the cells the go uh, they fork increase the speed of proliferation of cells. And um, basically mutations in these genes can result in a gain function, basically making them more effective, therefore causing cells to proliferate faster, resulting in a cancer. And these oncogenes are, uh, they're called, they are 
they follow a one-hit hypothesis, which basically a mutation in one allele can cause um, this effect to make them uh, mutate into a gain function mutation. And here's a list of just a few of the oncogenes that are found in the body. Um, tumor suppressor genes, as they, as they are named, they basically suppress tumors from occurring and they do this by controlling the cell cycle and they're basically the checkpoints that look for errors in the DNA and if there are errors, hopefully repair them, if not causing apoptosis of the cells. Um, and basically these are examples that you do need to know are P53 and retinoblastoma or RB. And these follow a two heap hypothesis, which means that they need two mutated alleles to cause cancer and there are a loss, which is a loss of function mutation. So they basically lose their ability to suppress tumors. Um, in terms of the P53 protein, it is, um, it basically causes or it initiates cell cycle arrest, which causes DNA repair and the cell cycle to restart, or it causes apoptosis and the death and elimination of a damaged cell. However, when DNA, this is usually when there is DNA damage. However, uh, when this gene is um, mutated, this doesn't occur and therefore cell arrest doesn't happen, nor does apoptosis and the cell just continues running through the cell cycle, causing it to become cancerous. Um, mismatch repair genes. Um, these are basically the genes that check DNA and repair it when there is a problem. And this is also under the two-hit hypothesis, and it's a loss of function mutation requiring two mutated alleles to cause the cancer or to basically stop functioning. And they repair DNA during the S phase. Um, in terms of metastasis, um, which is basically the invasion and spreading of cancer cells from a primary tumor to a secondary tumor site. Um, and it's basically that the cancer cells themselves secrete enzymes which break through capillaries or lymphatic systems, allowing um, the cancer cells to enter such uh, the system and have the fluids within it uh, pull the cells into another um, organ or part of the body, such as lymph nodes, the heart, the lung, so on and so forth. And um, they basically adhere to those um, new sites and begin growing. Um, into another tumor, becoming a secondary tumor. Um, there's also secondary colonization. Um, cancer cells basically secrete a vascular endothelial growth factor, and this basically promotes angiotensin, which angio meaning blood cells, uh, angiogenesis, angio meaning blood cells, and genesis meaning the creation of. So you get new blood vessels, and this basically allows them to leach more uh, nutrients from the body and more effectively get nutrients to the cells of the cancer, allowing it to grow faster. Uh, tumors may remain dominant for years, uh, dominant for years before this is successful though. Uh, there's, types, there's two types of tumors. There's benign tumors and malignant tumors. And basically benign tumors are the ones that you don't have to worry too much about as they're not spreading and they're basically a contained tumor within a fibrous capsule. And because of that, they aren't likely to spread and it's not that big of a problem as they're not affecting um, the structures, or they're not affecting greatly the structures around them or the ability of um, uh, the organ or cells that they are around. And uh, however, they do cause issues if they're growing in fine spaces like the brain as it's within a skull, uh, it's in a hard casing and it can't actually uh, expand. So if there is a tumor in the brain, it must be removed because it growing can put, put pressure on the others, other parts of the brain, causing it to die. Um, in terms of malignant tumors, they are the worst kind of tumors because they, have, they will metastasize and they will invade surrounding tissues, causing wreaking havoc, havoc around those tissues and causing them to no longer function properly. Um, here's a nice diagram or schematic, I guess, images. Um, and we can see just in the normal cells how we have nicely shaped cells with 
um, small nuclei and then benign we get larger ones but they're both contained in a small area and benign high we get we can see the darkening of uh, the nucleus and the expansion and malignant we can see how large the uh, nuclei have expanded and how they've changed in shape the cytoskeleton um, basically the effects of tumors um, they basically as they grow into uh, normal tissue, they displace it um, and they, as they grow, they cause, uh, they make, they, <clears throat> as they don't function like normal tissue, as they're immature, they basically reduce the function of wherever it is present. So let's say it's in the stomach, it will reduce the ability of the stomach to absorb nutrients. And also as they're just a mass growing, they can block vessels such as um, not just blood vessels or lymph vessels, but also if it's growing in the throat, you might have problems swallowing as it's just a massive lump there that you won't be able to get food past. And in terms of if it was in the stomach, because you're unable to absorb nutrients and food, you can become uh, cachexic, which is uh, when a person is very frail because uh, of weight loss. Um, uh, indications that a cancer is inherited, only about 10% are, but um, basically it determines on penetrance, uh, which is the percentage of individuals which that have the affected gene to develop the cancer, having related relatives with a common cancer, and um, it has, either has an early age, early age onset, or they're bilateral in nature, so both eyes, both breasts, both ovaries, uh, or a tumor that is present in two different organs. Um, here are some examples. So let's say colon cancer, which um, begins as familiar adomatous polyps and basically is caused by the mutation uh, APC, which is a tumor suppressor gene. And this gene is responsible for cell adhesion and the signal transduction pathways. And it almost has a hundred percent penetrance. Um, and basically, what we see is that in the bottom image we have the normal um, colon and its nature. It's like well defined, has um, its grooves and invaginations. Whilst in the top image we have these polyps, these small um, growths that uh, accumulate across the whole um, surface, and this results in um, the colon losing its function to absorb water from um, the digestive tract and causes malabsorption as a result. Another example that we probably all know is breast cancer, and this is due to mutations in the BRCA gene. And um, the individuals who have breast cancers are also predisposed to ovarian cancers. And the, the indications of inherited breast cancer are basically bilateral breast cancer, concurrent ovarian cancer, early age onset, and male breast cancer, as it's not only uh, in females that breast cancer can occur. Another example is retinoblastoma, which is the mutation in RB, uh, important tumor suppressor gene that you guys actually need to know. And um, basically there's two types of um, the mutation, uh, either it's a hereditary one and it occurs at a young age and it occurs in both eyes. And this results in blindness as well as further systemic problems if it does spread. And then we have the sporotic type, which occurs only uh, occurs later and only occurs in one eye. And it's because of mutations in some cells of chromosome 13. Um, and another example is chronic myeloleukemia. This is a pretty cool one because this is where we see the translocation of chromosomes and we get a Philadelphia chromosome. And um, basically this results in uh, the, it messes up one of the protein kinases uh, required in um, a signal transduction pathway. And this basically results in um, uncontrolled production of myeloid cells, uh, macrophage dendrites, and basically it results in an immature um, immune system. Sleep. 
Any questions? Oh, I'm in the chat. Um, James, I'll let you continue and um, I'll just answer what is the messages in the direct. Yeah, no worries. I'll um, just get the slides up in a moment. Right, hopefully you all can see that. Um, okay, so we've got a, a thing here called blood components and hematopoiesis. Um, so that's what it was for us last year. Uh, we noticed that your lecture has a slightly different title, so we're not sure how much overlap there is, but we're just going to teach you what we learned, um, which will all still be correct and relevant. Um, let us know if there's um, some significant areas of difference between um, this and like your muscular, I think it's like muscular and vascular supply and whatnot. Um, so let us know if there are some significant differences and we'll try and rectify those um, in a future session. Um, but yeah, for now, remember this is all correct stuff. Um, so you're gonna benefit from seeing it anyway. Um, and hopefully it should be pretty similar to what you guys are learning. All right, so what's actually in blood? Well, although we think of it as sort of a, a big fluid, in reality, when we get down to the very small level, um, the fluid makes up only about 55%, so about a little bit more than half. Um, and the red blood cells, um, which are the other major component of the blood, make up a pretty huge um, component. So a lot of blood, um, when you get down small enough, is solid, basically. Um, especially when we get down to like capillary level, um, you'll have like one red blood cell at a time pushing its way through the capillary. Um, and so in large blood vessels, that doesn't matter so much because you just have so much, it acts like a liquid. Um, but then the different composition does become quite important at lower levels. So what's in the liquid? Um, well, we've got um, water, obviously, that's a main component of the blood, but we also have proteins. So these can be um, various proteins required from the cell. Um, it can also be things like complement proteins. So it can be um, things relevant to the immune system. It can also be metabolites. So basically path, uh, parts of various different metabolic pathways within your cells. Um, and it finally, it can be nutrients. So um, you know things your body needs to survive, um, components, um, from your digestive system, which have been chucked into your um, vascular, uh, cardiovascular system, um, and which are now taken to cells. Speaking of cells, we have erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. We also have leukocytes. So those are our white blood cells. There are immune cells, which circulate in the cardiovascular system. Um, and we also have platelets, which are little um, thrombocytes, which basically help us form those blood clots that we talked about. Those are basically usually classified um, either with the rest of the cells, but also um, we can take the last two out and call them the buffy coat. They're a very small part of blood. All right, so hematopoiesis is basically how we um, make blood cells and platelets. Um, so we need certain nutrients for that. You can see vitamin B12, iron and folic acid. Um, and you can see here, we have a, um, basically a, um, an indication of where all of the cells in your, um, your uh, your bone marrow and whatnot end up um, forming, things like that. So we get a, a lot of um, formation in different places. Um, and by the end, um, we have a lot of, um, of variation. All right, so this is the really important slide. The previous one is, is um, basically looking at embryology. So embryological development. This is looking at all of the development. So if you remember one thing from this, remember this. So we've got um, a hematopoietic stem cell, um, and those basically form everything. So if you remember, we had a very similar diagram to this one um, when we talked about the origins of immune cells, because they come from the same basic lineage. Um, so on one side, we've got the common lymphoid progenitors. So we've got the lymphocytes, um, the plasma cells, and we've got also their natural killer cells. Um, and on the other side, we have the myeloid progenitor. So we have the myeloblasts, which make most of our innate immune cells, but we also have the megakarrier blasts and the prothereo blasts. Okay. So those ones are going to make our other major blood components, especially our erythrocytes, our red blood cells, um, and our thrombocytes to place with. So they all come from the common myeloid progenitors and ultimately from the hematopoietic stem cells. So pretty much all of our blood 
um, components actually come from this one progenitor cell. And so, sorry, the other thing to note um, is that all of these blasts you see here, um, they all hang out inside your bone marrow and then they eventually differentiate, develop into the circulatory versions. All right, so erythrocytes here, they are very, very highly specialized. Um, so first of all, we have the shape. This is pretty classic. It's like a, kind of like a, a hockey puck or something. Um, it's a biconcave disc, so it's like pinched in on both sides. Um, and that's important for A, we need to increase the flexibility because as I said, when we get down to the small level, these things are literally just squeezing through little holes um, in the, um, the, the cells basically, um, because that's what capillaries become. And we also want to maximize the surface area because we want to have the maximum oxygen exchange between these and the surrounding environment. A nuclei, they do not have a nucleus or organelles. So they can survive only 120 days. Um, if you remember, we talked about um, metabolism. These can only do glycolysis because they don't have mitochondria to do um, aerobic respiration. Okay, um, so they have a different um, pathway which they also use for um, for metabolizing things. But for the most period, like for the most part, these are basically um, cells with very reduced capabilities in some areas because they only need to be used to um, exchange oxygen. Uh, so they are highly, highly specialized for their purpose. Um, and when they die, which they will die after about 120 days, four months, um, we take them out in the spleen or the liver because of course we want to make sure um, that we don't have dead cells cluttering up the body. So how do we actually make these? Well, as we've said before, they come from the myeloid progenitor. So we've got um, a bunch of different intermediate um, cells there. You don't need to know all of those different um, components. Uh, it can be useful to talk about erythroblasts um, as just sort of a um, catch-all term for the um, the progenitor cells there. Um, the useful ones to know would be the myeloid progenitor erythroblast, um, potentially reticulocytes, um, and then especially erythrocytes themselves, so the functional red blood cells. Um, and so we have multiple ways to regulate how many blood cells you make, because sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less, especially if, if you're bloodless, you're going to need a lot more blood cells. Um, and so we have erythropoietin, um, which helps us um, directly regulate how the, um, the stem cells become the red blood cells progenitors, which will eventually, precursors, which will eventually turn into red blood cells. Um, and then we also have um, red bone marrow, which will help regulate the process. We've also got hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is the substance which actually hangs out inside the red blood cell. This is what they're specialized to carry. Um, so we have four globin chains, um, two alpha and two beta. So it's like two sets of two. Um, and each of them um, carries um, a heme molecule, basically. Um, so heme is a is like a, a coenzyme cofactor, like a, a functional group attached to um, the hemoglobin molecule which contains a iron ion. Um, and that's gonna be the major way that we carry oxygen. Um, so we have a huge amount of hemoglobin per red blood cell, um, and they're highly specialized to carry that hemoglobin throughout the body. All right, so oxygen saturation is another very important thing um, that we need to talk about. So this is actually so important, it's one of the vital signs, because if we have, um, a improved or um, uh, degraded oxygen saturation, then that can have serious impacts for how well the patient is. Um, so this is the normal curve. So we want our oxygen saturation to be very, very high usually. Um, and if we shift left, um, then that means that we have um, more affinity. So that you're getting more oxygen saturation um, without as much um, partial pressure, which is the major component in, in whether or not we have good oxygen saturation. Um, so we've talked there, there's a bunch of different um, uh, factors which are able to um, actually increase the ability of um, hemoglobin and red, therefore red blood cells to carry oxygen. Now, right shift is bad because it means we need more oxygen to make up um, the oxygen, sorry, more pressure to make the oxygen saturation. And it's not as easy to get come by pressure um, as it is to increase the other things. Um, so we wanna avoid a right shift if we can um, and keep it either the normal thing or in some cases left shift might be um, preferable. Not always though. All right, so iron metabolism. So we 
absorb it through the gastrointestinal tract. That should be um, capitalized, I think. Um, so we get heme iron um, from animal proteins and non-heme iron from plant proteins. So there's different purposes there um, because we don't only use iron for hemoglobin within the body. Uh, and we can recycle it. So remember, it's taken out by the liver or spleen um, when they die. And then we can chuck those back into the bone marrow um, where they can be used in new erythrocytes again. All right, so erythrocyte abnormality. So we can have many different things go wrong with, erythro with erythrocytes, basically. Um, and so the categories that we fit them into, uh, so the membrane itself, so we have a defect in structure. So we can have a, a change, um, say, shape of the muscle cell, uh, muscle cell of the um, red blood cell, um, or we can have um, antigens which, can, which cause a reaction from your body itself. So. Um, the defect in structure thing, um, if you remember, we may have talked about sickle cell anemia at some point, or you might have actually remember it from bio 3 4 because it features there um, for a little bit. That's basically when we get um, sort of, well, it looks like a sickle, that's why it's called that. Um, your red blood cells, instead of looking like a little bit of a puck, um, they end up taking a lot more sort of long, elongated um, and sort of slightly curved, and they, they just look very sickly under your, um, your micrographs. Um, and so that defect in structure is going to have serious impacts on both its ability to function because the structure is tied to its function um, and also its ability to say navigate through um, those capillaries and things like that. So it's they're going to be much less um, helpful to us and much less viable um, for a person, which is why sickle cell anemia can be quite important. Hemoglobin. So we can have either a defect in the global globin chains, um, so something's wrong with the protein being made, or we're not making enough protein. Um, so either of those can result in a defect. And we can also have just deficiencies in the enzymes, or um, we can be making, say, the wrong metabolites or have an imbalance of metabolites, which prevents us from having the normal pathways in operation. All right, so anemia um, is a decrease in the either the total number of red blood cells or the levels of hemoglobin. So either we don't have enough red blood cells or we have enough red blood cells, but they haven't got enough hemoglobin in them. Um, so it can be by decreased production of those. And there are many different um, sources of that. So we have a few of them listed there. Or we can have increased destruction. So there has to be some way um, that we're either not making enough or we're destroying too many in order to upset the balance of your body. Because we are constantly making and destroying red blood cells. They're short-lived cells and we make a whole lot of them and we destroy a whole bunch of them. Um, so if something has gone wrong, um, then we can result in anemia. The symptoms of this, you can pretty much see how all of these would be linked to red blood cells. So why we have fatigue? Because we're not getting oxygen to the body cells we can either. Why do we have weakness? Same reason. Um, why do we have shortness of breath? Um, either because of um, changed gas exchange in your lungs, but or also just because, again, um, your muscle cells involved in respiration aren't getting the oxygen they need. Pale, because we don't have as much um, hemoglobin and as much red blood cells hanging out in your vessel um, to actually give you more color. All right, so why might hemoglobin levels increase instead? So we can have kidney diseases, um, which cause us to increase um, the level of hemoglobin we produce. Um, and polycythemia vera will also increase um, the level there. We can also have dehydration. So this is basically um, your body responding to it um, by increasing hemoglobin levels. Uh, we can also have performance enhancing blood drugs. So um, athletes sometimes, they might take drugs which increase their hemoglobin production because that will increase their oxygen saturation and therefore give them theoretically more energy and more ability to perform in sports. So that's one of the reasons that we ban doping in sports because it can give people advantages like that. Um, and also lifestyle factors. So in smokers, we get increased hemoglobin levels and in people who live at high altitude, um, we get increased hemoglobin levels because they need more hemoglobin um, in order to compensate for the lower oxygen at those levels. Um, this is the same diagram again. This time we're gonna talk a little bit about leukocytes. So leukopoiesis, uh, basically the formation of leukocytes by blood cells um, is regulated by a bunch of different um, uh, cytokines and general signaling molecules. So CSFs, interleukins, um, which is basically one of the big categories of um, signaling molecules within the immune system. Um, and then we also have a few different stimuli which are immunological. So basically, something has gone wrong. So either there's an actual infection, bacterial or viral, or the body thinks there's an infection and you have an allergic reaction. Um, so your body's going to freak out and say, okay, well, we need more immune cells to deal with this. 
leukocyte abnormality. So change in numbers. So we can have either too many leukocytosis or we can have not enough um, because we don't have, as, uh, we, we either are not creating as many as we need or we're destroying too many. Um, and so the name for each of these is just, you take the, the name of the cell, so neutro or lympho, and then you chuck penia on the end if we don't have, um, if we don't have enough and we chuck cytosis on the end if we have too many. Um, so the nuclei of the, um, the immune cells can often be um, multi sort of fragmented um, and we can also have cytoplasmic inclusions in certain cells. And that's gonna vary on the different type of immune cells and the different um, variants of immune cells um, that are actually relevant. So neutrophils are the really big one. Um, those are known for having fragmented nuclei um, and uh, a major type of, uh, sorry, are probably the most abundant white blood cell type like we mentioned last week. Thrombocytes, so these are your platelets. Um, and so these are the main purpose of these is to make a blood clot, right? Um, so we have something called a megakarrier site, which is the actual cell which makes them. And then they release a whole bunch of little um, platelets into the bloodstream. Um, so remember the megakarrier site is the cellular component. Platelets themselves are not cells. Um, so we have this whole process, you can see on the right here, um, where we go from a stem cell um, to different um, progenitor cells and then finally to the megakarrier site itself. Um, and then once we reach that point, um, it's going to start secreting these platelets into the bloodstream. Um, thrombopoiesin is the um, signal molecule required to regulate this process, you can upregulate or downregulate it. Um, and then in general, um, thrombocytes, their main function is to thicken the blood. Um, so adhere things to one another, um, to aggregate things together, um, and to, to provide hemostasis. Right, so what can when can things go wrong? Well, we can have the same um, two things, basically. So thrombocyto is our um, prefix this time, and we just chuck penia. Um, uh, so we're decreasing the number of cells on the um, end if we don't have enough. Um, or we chuck cytosis, you can also have emia. Um, so we have a choice of different um, uh, suffixes in this case um, in order to describe an increase in the number of thrombocytes. We have too many thrombocytes. All right, and we have our functions there again. Any questions? Apologies if that was a little bit just so um, shout out to Marwan, who's the one who made these slides. Unfortunately, wasn't able to be with us this morning. Um, so I've been presenting them. Apologies if it's a little bit uh, awkward. Any questions about blood components and metapoiesis? Alrighty, looks pretty good to me. Um, so again, feel free to chuck something in the chat um, if you have a question that you're trying to write out right now, um, or which you come sorry, which comes up um, as we finish up, um, and uh, feel free to ask that there, and I'll either answer it once I'm once I reach another break, um, or Raymond might be able to answer it in the intervening time. Okay, final topic. Let's talk about primary healthcare. This is another one of your HKS topics. Um, and so you, if you remember, you think back to that big pyramid we did, um, where we talked about the different layers of healthcare. This is the bottom, this is our first line. So what we're gonna focus on today um, is basically the principles of primary healthcare. So what are the things um, which we want an ideal primary healthcare system to have, okay? Um, so the first thing that we want it to be is well-founded. Um, and there are multiple um, sort of dimensions to this. So the first one is being founded in evidence, so scientifically founded. So when we have procedures, techniques, methods we use in primary healthcare, we want to make sure that those are the ones which the research is telling us are viable. Um, so it is very important that we have constant feedback from um, clinical trials um, and things like that to researchers, to then practitioners who then run their own trials and reviews and that sort of thing. Um, and we need to have a constant cycle of evaluating is what we're doing 
actually the best treatment and is it effective? Um, so we need to make sure that we have evidence-based practices there. We also need to make sure that it's practical. So we need to make sure we're not just using a cookie cutter approach. We need to make sure um, that for the people who are affected and for the healthcare practitioners um, who are doing it, we're using practical methods. Um, so this becomes very important in Hedgecast. We talk a lot about global health. And so although in Australia, we sort of have a bit of a sheltered view um, of healthcare sometimes, it can be very important in developing countries um, that we use adequate, um, but also reasonable primary health care um, for the resources available in those countries. Um, it should also be culturally acceptable. So this is a big thing, um, cultural safety and cultural acceptability, making sure um, that when we have, um, that when we have uh, a, uh, a, a, a way of approaching something basically, um, especially when it comes to just patient interaction um, and understanding what's important to them, that we are aware of um, how these backgrounds will change things. Um, and one of the big areas of focus we have is Australian Indigenous backgrounds because they can often be um, areas neglected potentially um, and areas where medical students and doctors might not know how to act. And so we want to make sure that we maintain cultural safety there. Um, so intersectionality is basically just a shorthand for um, talking about how people can have multiple intersecting needs and we can sort of make it um, more complicated for the doctor, but to the patient, um, it's vitally important that we take all of those needs into account. Um, and synthesize something which is going to work for them. All right, it also needs to be affordable. This one's pretty self explanatory. If you are providing people healthcare um, and they can't afford it, um, then they're going to either go into debt for it, which is not a good outcome, it is going to impact on their health in the future, um, or they're just going to turn it away, which will impact their health right now. So we need to make sure that the health that we provide people is actually financially viable for them. Accessible, so things that we, so primary healthcare, it's our first line of treatment. We need to make sure that everyone is able to access that first line of treatment because if things get worse and we, we need to escalate it, that costs more to the health system and to the person. Um, it is higher risk to the person and it can often have worse long lasting consequences. So we wanna make sure that as many people as possible are able to get in the door quickly. Um, and so we need to take out barriers to treatment which might prevent people from seeking help. Um, and again, on a geopolitical scale, when we start to zoom out to the entire world, we need to start thinking about really big um, disparities between countries. So, you know, um, whereas in Australia, it can, especially in an urban environment, it can be pretty routine to get a CT or MRI scan. Um, in a, a developing country, that can be almost impossible. Um, and so we need to ameliorate those differences if we're going to have a good standard of primary health care across the entire world. All right, participatory and empowering. So we want to make sure that um, primary healthcare is not just us dictating for the patient, this is what's good for you, this is what, what's important, you're gonna do this. Um, so we need to involve them in their own care um, and it, allow them to make their own decisions with good medical knowledge, um, which we've shown them um, and with um, expert advice basically. So it needs to be them in the driver's seat um, and our job is to help them and guide them there. Um, yeah, and so part of that is understanding different outlooks for medicine. So obviously we treat a traditional Western, uh, not, not traditional, we treat a, a modern Western and contemporary outlook on medicine. Um, whether or not we use traditional medical techniques, so sometimes, you know, not every doctor is going to be trained in alternative medicine, um, nor should every doctor necessarily be um, trained in traditional medicine, but you need to understand it if your patient is coming in with a traditional understanding of medicine, you need to be able to talk with them because it's not really very useful for you to say, oh, well, I don't really get that. Um, but here's what I think um, you need to be able to engage with them because ultimately they're the one in control of their care. You need to convince them um, that something is the, is the right course of action. Um, so we have the idea of a colonial gaze. So this sort of ties into the concept of neocolonialism, sorry, neocolonialism, which we talk about, especially in um, reference to Australia, um, which is where we have sort of a holdover um, from the colonial period in which we had a very, very strong maternal medical paternalism. Um, towards especially Indigenous peoples, um, in which we basically said, okay, well, we know what's right for you. Um, it doesn't matter what you think or what you want, um, we're going to do this instead. Um, of course, the, the culmination of that comes right up to things like the Stolen Generation, um, where we decided completely against the wishes of both the patients and their families um, that, okay, this is the right thing to do, therefore we'll do this. And of course, because uh, the people involved in those decisions didn't take into account a participatory sorry, a participatory approach and went for the exact opposite. We had major, major psychological um, and in many cases, physical 
um, impacts on the health of those populations for decades to come. All right, slightly happier topic. So selective primary healthcare, this is um, quite an effective framework. It's basically thinking about, okay, so what are the most, most important um, parts of primary healthcare for us to use in developing countries? Um, and one of the models that we use for this, probably the best known model for it is Gobi FFF. Um, this is the like accurately applied primary healthcare it has the potential to save millions of lives. So what do we need to look at? So we need to look at growth monitoring. So both of the person and the whole population, oral rehydration therapy. This is for diarrhea basically. So diarrhea in developed countries is almost non-existent as a cause of death. In developing countries, it is a major cause of death. Um, so just having oral rehydration therapy for diarrhea and also dehydration in general um, is incredibly important in, in maintaining that. Breastfeeding. So breastfeeding, um, making sure it's viable and making sure that people are able to do it is also important for health um, because it can, has a lot of major health benefits. Immuni immunizations. Um, it's hard enough to get people to... So Australia is sort of in a position where it's hard enough to get people to actually get the shots sometimes um, because we're so removed from the disease, diseases which they prevent. Um, you don't usually have these problems in developing countries because they can see the impacts of not having vaccines um, and immunizations. So the question for these guys is more to do with how do we get those to them? How do we get them at a price that they can afford? Um, or, and how do we ensure that they're administered correctly? Um, female education. So often we have um, a very um, poor level of, of education, uh, medical education um, for everyone, but also specifically for females. Um, and so ameliorating that is a major step in um, improving primary health care in these countries. Food supplements. So um, we often have low nutrition diets in many of these places. And so um, there are a variety of methods we can use to actually improve um, the nutritional content of their food. Um, and finally, family planning. So a lot of developing countries, family planning is almost non-existent. And of course, it is a major boon um, to us, um, sorry, to the population in general, if we're able to give them a better um, chance at planning their own families and, and being actually prepared for those sort of changes. All right, that pretty much wraps us up for today. Um, do we have any major questions that people would like to ask? Oh, are thrombocytes the same as mature megakaryocytes? Uh, no, so thrombocytes are the platelets. Uh, megakaryocytes are the cells which produce the platelets. Does that make sense? So your megakaryocytes are going to shed lots and lots of little fragments, which are thrombocytes in their own right. Uh, so thrombocytes are non-cellular. They're little components in the blood. Megakaryocytes are very much cellular. All right, I won't hold you here for any longer. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, if you have a question, stick around. Otherwise, have a great day and we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Thank you.